Good morning, everyone, and welcome to what I'm sure is going to be an action-packed day. I'm Michael Chenitz. I'm the head of technical marketing at Pertainer.io, and I'm going to talk to you a bit today about adapting cloud-native tech and why this is awesome, but also needs to happen with eyes wide open. Hopefully, I can share some insights picked up over the many years working with Kubernetes and cloud-native technologies. My background, my background, I have had a pretty varied career so far, and it, I think it's one that has really helped me immensely and, and really helped to deal with this latest technology trend. I started as an infrastructure engineer, pivoted to an IT architect, pivoted again to a consultant, and that led me to where I got my first taste of cloud native, eventually leading me to the CTO office at Cisco and now leading up technical marketing over at Portainer. So let's talk a little bit about disruption. Oh my goodness. What's up with the global economy? It's unbelievably expensive right now. The cost of everything is so high. Gas prices are out of this world. $7 for a head of lettuce. Come on. Running a business is equally as challenging. Staff are demanding higher pay, lots of sick leave to navigate business travel costs are through the roof. VC funding is super tight. And the number of companies that have unfilled vacancies is just insane. So this is causing terrible service across so many areas of business. Have you traveled lately? Have you seen what traveling is like? Because of this, consumers and even businesses with spare money are spending it extremely wisely and only spending it with companies that have a clear point of uh, di differentiation and for business purchases only with proposals that have a rapid ROI. So that's right, there's an economic squeeze right now. It's impacting not only B2C, but B2B. Most companies I speak to have frozen spend on all points of, I'm sorry, on all non-essential projects and lots have put hiring freezes in place. With this competition and the money being brutal at present, every single company should be looking at how to serve their customers and asking, can I do it better? Unfortunately, there's simply too many organizations that have no financial ability to invest in new digital initiatives, and ultimately, these will perish. However, this doesn't have to be the case. There are so many new cloud-based services that offer immersive digital experiences. That's even smaller enterprises can subscribe and innovate. This is, there's simply no excuse to be a passenger on an impending train wreck. Don't forget that we can compete in the global market as there's no such thing as domestic loyalty anymore. Just take a look at Amazon.com and Alibaba.com. Thriving as the new hyper-competitive global economy means embracing change and embracing technology. Every single business owner, and in fact, every single business employee should be thinking, how can I help my company thrive? And what disruptive services can we deliver or which one of our legacy services can we improve? If you are not looking at what your competitors, global as well as domestic, are offering, then you are already in trouble. You just don't know it yet. Problem is, there's only so much existing teams can do. And so all this information needs to be done while constraining, while constra with the constraints. How can you embrace the new now without incurring substantial cost increments in people or tooling? This is the art. So let's get down to it. How this is where the magic of cloud native comes in. Cloud native is quite simply the very best architecture for digital disruption. Cloud Native defines the way that you deploy and manage applications that support digital services. It's more than just the technology, it's an architectural philosophy. Cloud Native apps take the very best from what we have learned over the last 10 years around how we should architect, build, support, and scale applications. And Cloud Native lets you start small, scale on demand, innovate discrete components, and due to that nature, build with extreme efficacy. No need for heavy servers, expensive proprietary software, or anything like that. Cloud Native defines the applications are inherently portable, free from vendor lock-in, and provides versions extensible APIs that make it simpler to manage resources and services. It doesn't matter if you're innovating in the data center, in the cloud, on the factory floor, Cloud Native apps help you build fast, 
learn fast, and improve fast. Cloud Native Apps let you get a product into market in the fastest possible way because you can launch an MVP and then iterate quickly thanks to a microservices-based architecture. You can evolve discrete elements of your service based on user feedback, adoption, and you can do this in a really low-cost manner. Heck, the vast majority of modern CN applications are based off open source components. So you have no expensive DB costs, no expensive application server from top tier vendors and no expensive API gateways. All this is made with reusable and free components. So no commitment upfront costs to try out crazy ideas. Of course you can buy CN apps made by ISVs and that is still the recommended approach for smaller orgs. But you need to be sure that your ISV is genuinely designing in CN architectures so as, facility, as, as to facilitate rapid and non-intrusive updates of their software in your environment. Okay, so now what? To go all in in cloud native, you need to consider three things. One, how will you get the apps you need? Will you build them yourself or, or will you buy them? How will you get the, yourself a platform to run these apps on? How will you support it, update it, and triage it? How will your users deploy it? And how will you get your application live and keep it live? No point investing in an awesome app if your platform is up and down like a yo-yo. There's a pretty simple way to determine if you should build or buy. And that is, is there something out there already that does the job? If the answer is yes, then it's almost always better to buy than build. Trust me, even if something is 90% good enough to try and develop your own application that meets 100% of your needs will cost way more and take way longer than you expect. There's really only one good reason for building versus buying. It's when you're disrupting an industry and your technology solution will be your primary point of differentiation. Here's where I might get a bit jumbled, but pretty much any system of record should be procured as the risks are just too high to build your own. Systems of differentiation and system of innovation, however, are where you get choice. Again, if you were just wanting to wanting an e-commerce site, are you sure that Shopify, Magento, or any of the other famous engines are not good enough, customizable enough? Are you sure that you want to reinvent the wheel? It might be better to spend 100 hours customizing an off-the-shelf app than 500 hours building your own. Unless you have a massive in-house development shop or an external contract development house, I would not even begin to recommend creating something from scratch. Heck, look at my own company, Portainer. We have spent over 10 million in two years creating a Kubernetes management tooling. Do you think that three internal developers could build something as good? Take the lessons and translate it into your app stack. Most devs are either not, uh, I'm most, uh, sorry, most devs are either .NET or JavaScript and experience building either web apps or installable apps. Very few, in fact, we probably have all of you in this very room, develop in microservices and deploying containers. There are so very few cloud native devs that companies elect to self-build new apps. They need to be sure that they can recruit and retain one of you. If you cannot attract and retain cloud native devs, then I would strongly recommend the services or specialist development houses. If you are a cloud native dev, congratulations. Encourage your mates to learn the new stack. Okay, so now you have selected your app stack and you're either going to buy or build. But now what? You need some, somewhere to run this stack and that somewhere likely ends up being a container platform. Today, there are two primary container platforms, Docker for smaller deployments and I would argue for development and Kubernetes for everything else. Unless you have been living under rock, you will be very aware that Kubernetes and its ability to run containerized based apps is in a highly automated way across on-prem or cloud, truly unlocking hybrid cloud and removing platform lock-in. Kubernetes is awesome, and it's really simply awesome. It's the cleanest way to run modern IT stacks. And so it's something we all need to get comfortable with. But neither Docker or Kubernetes should be considered a platform. They're an orchestrator, which is just one element of a platform. Kubernetes is no more of a platform than an engine in a car, then the engine alone won't get you down the road to the shops you need. You need a car for that. 
Kubernetes is the same. Kubernetes plus some servers on-prem or cloud gets you the ability to deploy containers, but it doesn't give you much more than that. It's lacking the native tooling required to get into production and to deliver acceptable SLAs. A platform comprises all of these elements. You cannot fully embrace Kubernetes without the ability to triage container-based apps, view logs from short-lived and highly dynamic workloads, and automate the continuous deployment of applications. Running an app in Kubernetes is useless without people being able to connect to it. So ine inevitably, you'll also have to load balancer, proxy, DNS server, and dynamic SSL certs to manage. You cannot pass security muster without being able to securely store and scan the container images. And for sure, you should have policies and controls over Kubernetes itself. And you cannot have persistent apps without some degree of persistent storage, which also mandates backup and recovery for that data. So when someone says Kubernetes, assume they mean all the above. It's why I laugh when I hear people saying that they've adopted Kubernetes, have decided on AKS, EKS, and have made no consideration for the additional tooling needed. I'm sure you've all seen the CNCF landscape, it's mind boggling number of members. These are all here because they are an ecosystem that surrounds Kubernetes. And there are vendors, providers of the tech that enable the platform uh, mentioned prior. You need to be super careful not to get drowned in here though. So much choice is good, but it's also very bad. With all that choice, how do you find the good from the average? How can you know which products are worthy of your time to invest pilot? How do you know what can be here six to 12 months from now? There are a lot of tools that have been here donated to the CNCF because the original creators were overwhelmed at the cost to maintain. And, and so, so they have donated to the CNCF. The shift, the burden of maintenance to the CNCF is, is the main reason. This is good if there is a contributor pool, but if there's not, the tools age out quite quickly. Even for those, they retain their open source projects under their own entity. It's not sustainable to support them. They also end up dead. Be sure to be careful when you choose a tool. Make sure it's under active development. Make sure it's backed by a commercial entity. Make sure the commercial entity has a way to sustain their open source product and make sure that other people are using it. Lastly, things you want to be unique when it comes to the tools, these are very rarely a point of differentiation for you. Are you navigating the CNCF landscape and looking to select tools? Be super aware of compounding complexity. The Kubernetes API is a fast moving target and APIs are deprecated and brought from alpha to beta to release at nearly the speed of light. Every product you choose that uses these APIs needs to release a version in lockstep. And the more you have, the greater the chance of finding yourself in a position where you cannot upgrade Kubernetes because of the tool you rely on doesn't support the new version. That's dangerous given the pace at which CVEs are found and fixed in Kubernetes. You should upgrade as soon as possible, but not be forced to wait. Sometimes a multi-tool is the best as a multi-tool is managed as a single package. So you don't need to do the work to figure out how the interop matrices work. The multi-tool suppliers will do just that for you. As an example, multi-tool Red Hat OpenShift or Pertainer one vendor, one tool to manage the complexity of a number of underlying technologies. Remember that the more tools you adopt to create your platform, the more tools you your people need to learn, the more tools you need to be secure, and the more tools you need to update. Be careful what you wish for. At the end of the day, you are assembling a platform for two reasons. Make it easier for operations to manage the orchestrator, to agree on SLA and OLA, make it significantly easier for devs to serve and support the in-app production. But why? Because as mentioned previously, cloud native devs are very hard to come by. And when you do get some, you need to make them as efficient as possible. And wouldn't it be awesome if there was a way to bootstrap non-cloud native devs into the tech stack? And Kubernetes engineers are equally in short supply, so we should be able to take more traditional IT ops, IT admins, and ease their attention into managing Kubernetes. Okay, so you have your app and you have your platform, let's get this puppy live. The, the panacea here is that the tooling 
you have chosen allows you to spin up clusters, enables the logging, metrics, etc., and your team are able to manage a lot of minimal without a minimal uh, retraining. Again, the goal is to reduce the on-ramp in the tech adoption and then reduce the day two operational overhead. Remember, the reason we are doing all this is to get apps to market quickly. So the last thing you want to do is be forced to delay go live by six months while your team Google around trying to learn the tech or you have to advertise for new roles. Be careful though. Whilst we want to minimize the amount of change the existing staff need to undergo to be able to deploy the manage the apps and Kubernetes, be very clear, it is different. You cannot just take a VM admin and tomorrow have them manage containers. The tech is very different, very different, and it needs to manage differently. You do DR differently, you do BCP differently, you review logs differently, you monitor performance differently, and there are a lot of differences. If you are if you're going to try and treat a container like a VM, you will step on a landmine. Don't do that. <laughs> Again, this is why I say to start going cloud native shouldn't be an accidental architecture. It should be considered as it does impart substantial changes to your systems. This meme is pretty well known, but the thing is, it's accurate. There's a lot to know about Kubernetes and a lot of things to trip you up. It's critical that the complexity is well understood, respected, and that a plan is in place to be, to be dealt with this. Don't be fooled by those that says Kubernetes is easy. They are ignorant to the true complexity that lays under the surface. Sure, it's easy once you're a trained expert, but none of us are born experts in anything. There are a number of day two challenges that you will need to overcome. Again, these are challenges due to the challenge in architecture, and none of these should be a surprise. When it comes to your Kubernetes clusters, do you want to treat them as cattle or pets? Pets mean you need to update them, triage them, closely manage them, and cattle means you deploy a cluster to host your apps, and then there is a newer version. You spin up the new cluster, deploy your app there, and delete the old. Far simpler. How would you monitor and report on SLAs? How would you ensure security and compliance? How would you back up and provide DR for your applications? If you are modernizing leg legacy apps, are the ISVs comfortable in supporting them in containers? Kubernetes is designed to be dynamic. If you have a cab, board, they can accommodate this dynamic nature. But don't try and be a hero. Sure, it's awesome to be the first company to adopt a new technology from CNCF landscape, but really, it's that is it that smart? What happens if you have an issue and there is no peers around you to help you out? Ideally, you want a local ecosystem around you, around the tooling. Local events, local meetups, and locals all talk about the same tech stack. That's a massive risk reducer, so don't fall into that trap. Also, resist the urge to build a better mousetrap. Sure, you're a developer engineer and you like having the skills to build apps and solutions, but is it really a good use of your time to try and build a better tool that's already out there, already being maintained and already having a support network? Bash scripts, PowerShell scripts, these are all nightmare to maintain versus readily available tools and predictable release cadence. My advice is to ask yourself, can I pass the 3 a.m. test, which is it's 3 a.m., the system has suffered a catastrophic failure, how many of my teams can rally around to help fix it? If the answer is one or two, you're in trouble. I also strongly recommend ensuring you have a vendor support for open source components too. Sure, they have no upfront license costs, but then again, at 3 a.m., MongoDB has failed. Wouldn't it be great to be able to call customer, customer support somewhere? It's why VMware, Nutanix, MS all did it well, supporting these at times of crisis. And never lose sight of the goal. Remember, slide one, we're doing all this for one reason, one reason only, to help your business thrive. We're not doing this because the tech is cool. It is cool, but it's irrelevant. We're doing this because it's the best way to deliver game-changing digital services to the market. And so don't get tech drunk, remain focused and apply the value of your time. Once you apply a value to your time, you'll find spend far less time thrashing around and make quick decisions based off decisions that other have made before. Then sit back and relish in the fact that you are helping your business thrive. Thank you and enjoy the conference.